and welcome to Love Muslims Critique Islam Part 5 Women. Throughout this series of videos, I'll be sharing with you the truth of Islam that you won't get from the mainstream media and you won't get from Muslims. So let me reveal to you the secrets Imams don't want you to know and take you on a journey of absolute truth. There is little in Islam to satisfy the feminist. If you do a before and after Islam comparison of women's rights and women's lifestyles, you get two differing pictures. See, the picture of women when Muhammad was married to uh, his first wife Khadija uh, is vastly different to the situation which arose after she died. Family life therefore uh, after this event uh, are contrasting and Khadija was a businesswoman in her own right and as an employer of Muhammad was in fact his boss and women had more rights uh, pre-Islam um, so it could be the, actually leaders in society even uh, and also even um, polygamy was allowed for women then uh, so they could have more than one husband uh, before the uh, the beating was allowed, <laughs> um, women so had uh, well they had divorce rights. Uh, they could own property. Um, they could represent themselves in court. So just generally uh, a far more equal society then. But after Khadija's death came the death of gender equality, um, and the role of the woman became a stay-at-home housewife uh, unless her family financial difficulty dictated that she needed to go to work, uh, but she uh, still had to be required to keep the, uh, the housekeeping duties. Um, the husband is the um, is really seen as the, the, the protector and the provider for the family and very much uh, head of the household. Um, and in pre-Islam, uh, say for example, the, see there was no enforcement of, of the wearing of the veil for this uh, was something that was introduced in the Quran. Um, and after Khadija, uh, women were required to dress less uh, provocatively, uh, have a um, whole body covered and, and hair is covered as well. Uh, and, and in some more uh, Islamic states, uh, the face veil uh, would be in, included in the, uh, in, the, in the dress code. So a lot more of a different picture. So women are expected to stay at home, as I said, and uh, she needs a uh, male relative's permission to venture out. Um, see, the more restrictions on her, actually, the, the higher the family honour. Um, and so it's very much dependent on her obedience and, and modesty. Um, so it's also one of the reasons why Western women are seen as having less value and are seen uh, also as, as easy meat. Uh, as uh, we've seen described in uh, recent gang rape uh, uh, cases uh, in the UK. Um, now, as a woman is easily given in to temptation, she cannot therefore be trusted. Uh, so she must be, uh, that's the reason why she must be covered and, and chaperoned. Women are considered as possessions and, and, and they find themselves having less control over their lives and they become second-class citizens uh, rather than as equals. And women uh, are seen also as uh, being less intelligent and uh, are lacking in morals, and, and so they need a male guidance and, uh, and control. Uh, we read this in Sahir al-Bakari 2658, where the, the Prophet is having a conversation uh, with a woman and referring to um, the Sharia court system. Uh, he says, um, he asks, isn't the witness of a woman equal to half that of a man? And the woman says, well, yes. He said, well, this is because of the deficiency of her mind. And so it's her lack of intelligence uh, as the justification in their eyes uh, for valuing a woman's testimony as worth that half of a man's. Um, also, uh, Muhammad states that in hell, um, that um, mostly women will be there. Uh, and this is because they tend to curse and are grateful to their husbands and uh, are lacking in common sense. And 
Um, it's the reason for their deficient minds that is the um, that leads to, to to this lack of common sense. Um, and we read this uh, in uh, Sahih Muslim one four two, uh, where Muhammad says, uh, "Oh, women folk, you should give charity and ask much forgiveness, for I saw you in bulk amongst the dwellers of hell." Um, and the reference to most women being in hell, uh, well, just gives them even less hope of getting a place of paradise. Allah is going to decide whether their good deeds were good enough for entry, um, but uh, most won't be there anyway because uh, they were ungrateful to their spouses, apparently. Um, the men are in charge of women and are allowed to beat them. Uh, so with that being the case, it's not difficult to understand why these wives are ungrateful. And um, so those few women who do actually make it to paradise, uh, they'll have a pleasure of honouring their husbands <laughs> who are allowed to beat them uh, here on earth. So it doesn't seem like paradise much to me. Marriage life and marriage law tends to favour the man as uh, polygamy is allowed in Islam and they can even um, benefit from temporary marriages uh, of convenience. Uh, so if a man, for example, is away from his wife and he wants to visit a prostitute, he is allowed to have a muta marriage and a, um, where he, he, he marries a woman temporarily, um, lasting for up to about one hour, and, and then quickly divorce her as soon as his deed is done, and as fast as he can zip up his trousers. Um, uh, of course, for men, divorce is a lot easier, as all you need to do is repeat, I divorce you three times. Love before the marriage is not always necessary and is expected to grow as the years pass and within time. But Muslim girls are taught from young not to expect love from her husband, uh, but from her children. Um, arranged marriages are allowed in Islam and it's uh, been known for people to refuse arranged marriages uh, and it's, uh, it's increasingly happening in, in, the, in the West by modern Muslim women who are sometimes tricked into uh, going on holiday to the uh, country of their ancestors uh, only to find their marital fate has been sealed uh, but this uh, will bring great shame on the families concerned and has led to uh, the cases of, of honour killings. Uh, so, so we see a conflict between the, the generations here. Uh, two chronic verses in particular come down hard on women. Uh, Surah 415 in the Quran calls for the death of lewd women. And Surah 434 allows corporal punishment, even if you think she may have disobeyed. Um, so we read this, uh, but those wives uh, from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them, then if they persist, forsake them in bed and finally struck them. But if they obey you once more, seek no means against them. Indeed, Allah is ever exalted and grand. So that's uh, sort of 434. Uh, and the word strike here is, is uh, in this verse is uh, means to hit uh, in the original. Arabic language that so we are encouraged by Muslims to read the Quran in, so we have to go by the original Arabic. Girls need to be virgins uh, if they are to marry, and uh, marriage in Islam uh, is uh, for women a, a, a duty uh, and a godly gift, uh, and is um, really it's, it's a contract where a gift of money is is paid for the exclusivity of a bride, and anybody remaining single. Uh, is committing a sin and uh, remaining childless is a concept in Islam that just doesn't make sense. Uh, usually the, there is an, a, an agreement between two families for the marriage pairing. Um, this is a pairing of convenience and is often arranged at the heart. Uh, so it's more seen as a business contract than a love match or, or two people, uh, especially if the marriage is arranged outside the family uh, where the reason for permission to marry uh, could be for status, for example, or financial gain. Um, and not, almost all Islamic marriages are arranged and commonly the bride and groom will be related as first or second cousins. 
And with uh, some couples, uh, they might not even meet until the very day of their marriage. Uh, interfaith marriages are only allowed for men and provided that uh, she, the bride, converts to Islam and the children are brought up as Muslim. As women are inferior to men, uh, they have less legal rights and a Sharia court system um, is heavily weighed against her. Uh, it makes things difficult, though not impossible, uh, for her to obtain a uh, divorce. Uh, which now, uh, as then, uh, involves a Sharia court system that is pro-male and not supportive of her. Uh, and it considers a woman's testimony as worth half that of a man's, as I said before. Uh, and therefore, um, two female witnesses are needed for every one man's. Um, so for divorce proceedings, um, as indeed in any case brought up uh, uh, by a woman uh, against a man, uh, she needs therefore these two witnesses to, to his one. Um, as refusing to marry uh, your chosen partner is a hugely humiliating experience for the respective families. Divorce is even more so, so it's even worse. Uh, a wise family could share in the humiliation uh, should she leave her husband uh, and would disown her no matter what treatment she had uh, caused her to, to, to leave. Uh, and if a divorce is granted, uh, the wife will lose her children uh, as she's the one that instigated the divorce proceedings or if she leaves Islam, uh, except if, if, if the uh, children are still being breastfed. Uh, so until that baby is on solids, um, they have to remain with the mother until that point. Um, and for injury compensation cases, uh, a woman still uh, will get uh, half that of a man who receives. And it's the same for family inheritance as well. So, so where a daughter would only get half of what her brother gets. As the Sharia court system is heavily biased against women, uh, some rape victims are seen as culprits in this crime and can receive punishments um, ranging from uh, imprisonment uh, to a flogging or a death by stoning, as is happening widely in Pakistan. Now you see, the behaviour and attitude to women by uh, Islamic terrorists, for example, or rape gangs, um, come from Mohammed's example of how he treated women. So this is where they get it from. Women were captured and distributed to Muhammad's followers as booty or as a prize. Um, and in the media, uh, the, these high profile red gangs uh, cases uh, recently in the UK uh, have the, uh, they, they describe the perpetrators as men of Pakistani origin. Now, this is not fair. Uh, for law-abiding men of Pakistan because um, what they have in common, these perpetrators, is Islam and what the media is doing is, is uh, suppressing the ugly and thorny truth that Islam is the problem, not the fact that they're from Pakistan. Female genital mutilation or FGM, which is the practice of cutting a clitoris uh, has been illegal in the UK for over three decades, uh, whilst finally political correctness have been pushed aside long enough for the banning of this practice to be put in statute. Uh, but even though uh, to date there have been no successful prosecutions, uh, despite that about uh, 130,000 Muslim women in Britain have had this performed on them here or abroad. Now, Muslim scholars agree that female circumcision is a recognised Islamic practice, uh, though many Islamic apologists uh, would deny this. So it is simply not true, therefore, to claim that FGM has nothing to do with Islam, nor is it true to say it is only an African problem and that some would like to uh, have us believe. Some uh, Muslims point to uh, Surah 4 uh, verse 1 and Surah 4 5 uh, 
uh, for uh, equality for women and proof that women are to be treated with kindness. But both these verses are abrogated by the verses that follow in this uh, same chapter, chapter four, uh, which is littered with verses which deny women's rights. Uh, so, for example, we read that uh, there is uh, polygamy. Uh, women are given less inheritance. Um, it calls for the death of um, sexual women, uh, their obedience to men, uh, the, the allowance of physical punishment. Um, you see, the, the degrading of women is rife in Islam and is supported by men who are allowed to marry slave girls again uh, in this chapter. And also uh, that they uh, excel women. Uh, so it's a, it's a real put down. Uh, and there are stipulations of how women should behave in Islam uh, with verses on how to speak uh, to avoid seducing a man and call for women to stay in houses and act modestly. So uh, the verses that uh, stipulate how women are to behave, they underline the control that men have over women in Islam. Uh, there are stipulations on how to speak, um, stay in houses, um, obey Muhammad as you obey Allah. Uh, Muhammad's privileges can take women offering themselves. Uh, he takes wives as he wishes. Uh, Muhammad's number of wives are limited except slaves he's attracted to. Um, you know, you, you can't talk to Muhammad's wife unless it's behind a screen. Uh, do not annoy Muhammad or marry any of his wives after death. Um, and as I read before, men are in charge of women and uh, men can beat their wives. So, you know, this uh, behavior and example for men on how to treat women just comes from Muhammad's example of how he treated them. So let's look at the Merry Wives of Muhammad, shall we? Um, after Muhammad's first wife, Khadija, died, uh, Muhammad married Sauda bint Zama uh, just a few days after her first marriage was uh, annulled uh, when her husband converted to Christianity. She was uh, an early uh, convert to Christianity and um, he married her when he was uh, unpopular and uh, bankrupt. Um, he considered divorcing her because she was the oldest and plainest of his wives uh, as she was fat and very slow. And he did not find her attractive uh, when she was in her 40s. But she pleaded not to be cast off and to be kept within the household for protection, um, but on condition that she would forfeit her sexual rights to Aisha his uh, child bride, I think that pleased him immensely, I think. Um, when a wife thinks her husband will leave her, it's down to her, you see, to do all she can to aid reconciliation, uh, which is what Sada is doing here uh, by foregoing her sexual rights and um, therefore blame would not fall upon her. Um, you see, it was Muhammad's will that he would assign a specific day of visitation for sex uh, to keep all his wives happy. And Saudi was saying, uh, well, I will give up my uh, day in bed with you, uh, providing you just keep me on your household. Zainab bit Josh, uh, she was the wife of uh, his adoptive son, Zaid, uh, Muhammad's first cousin and married Muhammad after he received convenient revelation allowing his adopted son to divorce her so that the marriage to Muhammad could take place. Um, you see, whenever Muhammad is questioned about the morality of his behavior, he would often have these revelations of convenience uh, given him permission to carry on doing what he wanted to do. Uh, and so he gave the instruction for adopted sons uh, to be called by their blood father's name, or uh, if you didn't know that, uh, called them brothers in faith. And this now reverts any adopted son to their original family name, uh, if known, and uh, to render them unadopted, uh, thus bringing the end to the practice of adoption. Didn't know that, did you?
Rehana bint Zaid, uh, Ibrahim Amir, uh, was a wife of a Jew and made a widow and was taken as a slave during the uh, uh, Banu battle uh, when 750 men were killed. Uh, having been made a widow by Muhammad, she refused to convert uh, and so was kept as a concubine as prize, uh, but still married her anyway. <laughs> Um, uh, now another wife whose name I always struggle to pronounce so I'm not even going to pronounce that or attempt to uh, there it is on the screen you, you have a go if you want to uh, she was the uh, and she was another wife of a Jewess and uh, also taken as booty and was said to be very beautiful uh, she was the wife of a chief uh, who was defeated in battle uh, around about 628 AD. Uh, she tried to buy her freedom, but uh, she caught Muhammad's eye and um, he married her at the age of uh, 58 uh, when she was just 20 years old. And Aisha uh, was uh, sp supposed to be uh, really quite jealous of her beauty. Sophia bint Huai, um, yes, another name I can't pronounce either. Um, was the 17 year old wife of another Jewish chief, uh, Kaiba Kanana, and was forced to become uh, Muhammad's wife when her husband and cousins were tortured and burned at the stake to reveal the whereabouts of their hidden wealth uh, at yet another siege. Uh, I think it's the Battle of Kabar around 629 AD, uh, which was won by Muhammad when the Jews surrendered. Uh, Zavai's father, brother, uncles, cousins, and husband were all subsequently killed. Um, a pattern emerges with captured women taking the slaves that uh, takes Muhammad's fancy, um, to where he offers their freedom from slavery in exchange to becoming his wife, uh, provided they convert to Islam. When Muhammad went to his wife Hafsa for her day of sex visitation, he found her not around, but uh, instead came across Hafsa's uh, slave girl and uh, had sex with her instead. Um, she was a beautiful Coptic Christian called uh, Maria bin Shamun al Kuptaya, uh, who was a gift from the uh, governor of Egypt. Uh, Maria fell pregnant, but unfortunately, um, the baby didn't survive. And Aisha was very jealous. Uh, and both women refused to sleep with Muhammad, which led Muhammad to receive another of his convenient revelations from Allah, uh, threatening to replace them with better wives for him uh, if they didn't start towing the line. And uh, Muhammad's convenient hotline to Allah came in handy once more when Umm Salama uh, bint uh, Abi Umayyah Another one of his wives complained uh, she was being ignored. Um, Muhammad had a growing reputation as a philanderer uh, by this time, and some women found this attractive and offered themselves to Muhammad, which didn't always go down well with the families, as uh, shown in these words of one particular father, who says, uh, you are a self-respecting girl, uh, but the prophet is a womanizer. When Muhammad was attacking the family of uh, Muleika bin Kaab, uh, they gave their beautiful daughter to appease him, uh, but he killed them anyway, and because of that, she demanded a divorce. Uh, Fatima al Alaya bin Zabian al Dakhak uh, converted to Islam when she married Muhammad. Uh, but uh, she was a uh, she was a bit naughty and uh, was caught spying on men in the mosque courtyard, and she was divorced. Uh, life got a bit um, smellier uh, after that uh, when she was assigned to dung collecting duties. And so we come to uh, Aisha bin Abu Bakr, uh, Muhammad's six-year-old child bride. And I will leave the last words of Muhammad, comparing his this uh, favourite wife of his uh, with his favourite meal. When we read this in Sahih al-Bukhari 3, 4, 11, uh, where he says, 
Many amongst men reached the level of perfection, but none amongst the women reached this level except uh, Asiah, Pharaoh's wife, and Mary, the daughter of Imran. And no doubt the superiority of Aisha to other women is like the superiority of Farid to other males. Uh, says it all really. And um, till next time, goodbye.